Well, guys, I guess we can go ahead and get started. So today we're going to be talking about Chapter 8. And Chapter 8 is the last chapter before your first exam, okay? Um, the way that I do things is I have a study session for the entire, entire class period before the exam, okay? So on Thursday, we will have a study session. What that entails is I go through each of the chapters and I kind of whittle down some of the information for you, okay? What I recommend that you bring with you is the study guide, preferably filled out, okay? I know the study guide is relatively long for a study guide, um, but if you think of it in this way, I'm taking 300 slides and consolidating it down into seven pages. So it's really not that long, okay? Um, what the study guide is designed to do is to help you kind of just condense the information into something you can easily flip through. And then I will help you whittle down the information during the review session, okay? So then you can cross things off in the study guide as we go. Any questions? Okay. So, with that said, we'll go into chapter 8, and chapter 8 deals with a concept called metabolism, okay? Metabolism are essentially all of the chemical reactions that occur within the cell, okay? It's really important that, uh, hopefully by the end of this chapter, you realize that a cell isn't like a person, okay? It's not constantly thinking about what it needs to do or what it needs to eat and so forth. Instead, the way that a cell works is totally based upon the chemical reactions that are occurring within it, okay? So a cell is literally a bag of millions of chemical reactions that are happening simultaneously, and based on what reactions occur, that dictates how the cell functions, okay? It's very similar to us when you really narrow it down to single cells, but a lot of times people think that cells are, you know, like intelligent, they're not, okay? They literally are just chemical reactions, and we're gonna talk about some of these reactions uh, today. So, um, <clears throat> When we talk about metabolism, this is essentially all of the chemical reactions that occur within the cell, and there are two groups of chemical reactions we can talk about. Catabolic reactions and anabolic reactions, okay? Catabolic reactions are where you take large organic molecules, like glucose, for example, and you break that apart, okay? You pull it apart into the smaller pieces. In the process of doing that, energy is released, okay? And what the cell has the ability to do is take that energy and temporarily store it in a molecule called ATP. Okay. It then can utilize that energy stored in ATP to go through anabolic reactions. And anabolic reactions are where you're taking two smaller molecules, pushing them together, making larger molecules. And when you do that over and over and over and over again, you get a cell. Now, for anabolic reactions to occur, you need energy. Where does the energy come from? It comes from that ATP that was produced earlier. So this becomes kind of a vicious cycle. You break crap down, you store its energy, and then use that energy to build things up. Break things down, get energy, build back up, okay? So metabolism, again, all the chemical reactions uh, that happen within the cell. These reactions can assemble smaller molecules into larger macromolecules. This is known as anabolism, okay, or anabolic reactions. You can degrade macromolecules or big molecules into smaller molecules in the process releasing energy. This is known as catabolic reactions, okay, or catabolism. And then this energy is conserved in the form of ATP or heat. For prokaryotes and single-celled microorganisms, even single-celled eukaryotes, Almost all of the energy is conserved as ATP, which means the cell can then use it later on for other stuff, okay? In higher order organisms like ourselves, sometimes the energy is lost as heat. And when that happens, the cell temperature increases, and this is what allows us to regulate our body temperature, okay? This is the default, losing as heat. So if the cell does nothing, it gets lost as heat. But for prokaryotes, this is bad because it wants that energy. So it conserves most of its energy in the form of ATP. And again, anabolism, also known as biosynthesis, is where you take molecules and stick them together until you eventually get a cell. So you will start off with nutrients from outside of the cell. You will then convert this into organic molecules that you can use as backbones to make things. And then you'll make things like amino acids, nucleotides, fatty acids. These will then assemble into proteins, 
RNA, DNA, and so forth, until eventually you form a cell. Okay? So it's really just a bunch of small stuff that gets added together, together, over and over again, until the cell becomes full. Catabolic reactions, or catabolism, again, is where you're bringing in nutrients, you're breaking that nutrients down, releasing energy. Okay? And then you can store that energy in the form of ATP. We are primarily going to focus on catabolic reactions in this chapter. Okay? <coughs> the reasoning for that is, is they're much simpler to understand, even though for most of you, you will still think they're complex and annoying. But they are simpler than anabolic reactions, which is good. Also, we will talk about anabolic reactions, at least the, the end result of anabolic reactions in chapter 9. Okay? So this chapter is primarily going to talk about how do we take a molecule like glucose, tear it apart, and get energy from it. Now, uh, for this to occur within a cell, you need to get the ball rolling. Okay? You need to get something happening for these reactions to occur. And the way that we get the ball rolling is we use something called an enzyme. Enzymes are biological catalysts. So hopefully from chemistry class you remember what a catalyst is. A catalyst is a, a molecule that you feed into the reaction, and this allows the reaction to occur with less energy. Okay? And by doing so, the reaction becomes much more efficient. And so when we're talking about biological systems and cells, instead of saying catalyst, we say enzyme. Okay? And these enzymes are mostly uh, made out of protein, okay? um, but they can be made out of other things. And they're often made by the cell themselves. Okay? They don't really acquire them usually from the environment. So why do we use catalysts? Well, for every reaction that occurs within the cell, there's something called the energy of activation. This is the amount of energy required to get that reaction to occur. Okay? So in this example, we have a macromolecule, and we want it to become two smaller molecules. For that to occur in a normal situation without any enzymes or catalysts, we would have to put in this much energy, so from here to here, for this to spontaneously occur, and then we would get our final products. So the activation energy for this particular reaction would be from here to here, right? Okay? Now, if we throw in an enzyme, which can lower the amount of energy required for this uh, uh, reaction to occur, instead of following the dark green line, we now follow the light green line. So now you can see it requires energy, but much fewer amount or much less amount of energy compared to the dark green line. So we can get the same end products at the end of the day, but now we don't have to put in that much energy for it to occur. These are really, really, really important biological systems. The reasoning is, is that for most of the reactions that occur within a biological system, the amount of energy that would be required without a catalyst would be way too high. And it would ultimately <coughs> usually result in the cell's death. So without the enzyme, these reactions do not occur. Okay? Now, in uh, chemistry class, we would call these reactive molecules. These are the molecules that get modified during this process. In biology, we call these substrates. Okay? So the <coughs> substrate is what the enzyme or the catalyst can lower the activation energy of, allowing for that reaction to occur with less energy required. So what are enzymes? As I said before, they are mostly made of protein. And we can classify them in one of two ways. It's a simple or a conjugated enzyme. A simple enzyme is just all protein. This means as soon as it's made by the cell, it's ready to go. It doesn't need to have anything extra added to it. Conjugated enzymes are the protein that the cell produces, but then other bits and pieces need to bind to it before it functions. By far and large, the most common enzymes you're going to find in a cell are going to be conjugated. Why? Well, because these require extra bits and pieces to be added onto them before they function, the cell can use this as kind of like an on-off switch. Okay? So yes, it can make the enzyme, but unless something's stuck to it, it's not going to function. So it just sits there and it waits until the cell allows it to work. So conjugated enzymes, this is where you have to add something to it for it to work, and what you add to it is known as a cofactor. Okay? And these cofactors can be other organic molecules, which we call coenzymes, or they can be inorganic elements, which are mostly metals. Okay, so we call these metallic ions. 
So uh, hopefully you remember from the last chapter, I showed you all the nutrients, and then towards the end I said, these are all the trace nutrients we're not going to talk about, a lot of metals and things. Those trace elements are primarily there to act as metallic cofactors, okay? to actually get these enzymes to function. So here we have a protein, or a, an enzyme, and you can see the protein portion of it, which is the, the purple blob. This is what the cell makes. If this was just produced by the cell, it would not function. The only way it would function is if a metallic cofactor is present, can bind to it, and now it is turned on. So if the cell wants to turn this enzyme off, it gets rid of the cofactor, pumps it out of the cell. If it wants to turn it back on, it pumps that back into the cell and it starts working. Coenzymes are organic molecules that do the same thing. They have to bind somewhere on the enzyme to activate it. And sometimes it can get complicated where you're going to have multiple different cofactors. It could be a couple coenzymes, a couple co um, cofactors. It could be literally hundreds of different cofactors. So how are enzymes made? So as I mentioned before, they are protein. We'll talk more about how proteins are produced within the cell in chapter 9. But when proteins are produced, they literally are what we call a chain of amino acids, also known as a peptide. Okay? This long string of amino acids isn't really functional yet. Instead, it needs to be folded. The first folding that happens is what we call secondary structure. And this is where it turns into a helical structure or into a flat sheet, called a beta pleated sheet. These then fold on themselves even more, forming a complex tertiary structure, or what looks kind of like a ball of yarn. And then a bunch of these tertiary structures come together, and this will eventually form your complete protein. So you can see it's relatively complex, and it ultimately has a relatively complex shape. The reason why we bring this up is because this is what determines the enzyme's function. The shape of the enzyme is what determines what substrates or what molecules can bind to it and subsequently be manipulated by that enzyme. So having the shape is essential. And the reason for that is, is it allows for something called the lock and key mechanism. So here we have our enzyme. It's got this complex 3D shape. It's a big ball of yarn. And in it, it has something called an active site. And an active site is where all the magic happens. This is where your substrate binds, and this is where it will then get manipulated by the enzyme. This active site, in this instance, has this very distinctive shape. Okay? And this shape is what dictates what the enzyme can bind to. Only a substrate that matches that shape perfectly can bind into that active site and then be manipulated. Any other shapes, like this guy down here is too fat, he won't fit in, and he won't be touched by the enzyme. So the shape is what determines how the enzyme functions. Okay? Because the substrate binds to the enzyme perfectly. And this is what allows for it to occur. So a little bit more about cofactors. So I said they can be either metallic, which are inorganic, or organic, or co also known as coenzymes. The metallic cofactors are those trace elements we talked about before, like iron, copper, magnesium, manganese, and so forth. And these bind to the enzyme and turn it on, usually by changing its shape slightly so that it functions better. Coenzymes are organic compounds. These are usually taken in by the cell. And a lot of times, the coenzyme is actually the substrate, okay? And so if you think about it, it's kind of an ingenious system. Let's say I have an enzyme, we'll call it lactase, and it's designed to break down lactose, a sugar, something that this, the organism can utilize for food. The cell can produce this lactase enzyme and have it just sit there in a dormant state. Now let's say I give myself some lactose that comes into the cell, it will bind as the cofactor to that enzyme, activating it, and now that enzyme will go up and chew up all of the lacta lactose that's in there, giving the cell energy. So a lot of times these are, the, the coenzymes are the same as the substrate. And when we talk about this as far as humans or animals, a lot of times we call coenzymes vitamins. So a lot of the vitamins that you take are actually coenzymes. They're designed to wiggle their way into cells and help your enzymes work better. How do we classify enzymes? Well, we classify them based on what they do, 
okay? Their name tells you a lot about what they do. So here we have an example. This is lactase, the one I just talked to you about. This breaks down lactose. Anytime you see ace at the end of a word, it denotes that it's an enzyme, okay? The lact in front tells you it's for lactose. Ace tells you it is an enzyme. Penicillinases break down penicillin. Polymerases make polymers okay, of DNA. So usually the name tells you a lot about the function of that particular enzyme. Where can enzymes be found? Well, you can find them outside the cell. This is known as an exoenzyme. Or inside the cell, this is known as an endoenzyme. Exoenzymes are usually released by bacteria in particular to break down uh, nutrient-rich material. Okay? Where this becomes important for us is in disease. So what bacterial uh, pathogens will do is they will release exoenzymes. This breaks down your tissues so they get nutrients, but it also makes you feel sick, causing an immune response. Endoenzymes are usually used for anabolic reactions. They're found in the cell, and they're used to make things. Right? So they're used to make DNA, RNA, protein, and so forth. Now, enzymes can always be on. So there are some enzymes that are on all the time. And these are what we call constitutive enzymes. Or they can be turned on or off depending on the cell's need. These are known as regulated enzymes. Okay. Constitutive enzymes are going to be vital for cell life. So if they're not there, the cell dies, so it always has them on. Regulated enzymes are going to be enzymes that are potentially dangerous, okay? Where if they don't have something to do, if they don't have a substrate to play with, they may cause problems. So the cell will turn them off so that they don't do this. So what actually is happening in an enzyme, okay, when it binds to a substrate? So here we have two examples, okay? In the first example, we've got our enzyme, which is this big purple blob, and we have two smaller molecules, okay? that are binding into the active site. And then we're adding in some energy from ATP, and bing, bang, boom, we get a bond that forms, and now we get a larger macromolecule. What type of metabolic reaction do you think this is? Anabolic or catabolic? Two smaller molecules becoming one larger molecule, requiring energy. Anabolic, so this is an example of an anabolic reaction. Conversely, we can have a larger molecule that binds within the uh, active site of this enzyme. It destabilizes electrons. This causes a bond to break between these two molecules, separating them apart, and releasing energy in the process. What kind of reaction would this be considered? A catabolic reaction. Good. So what exactly is happening at a molecular level? Well, to make it as simple as possible, what's actually happening are redox reactions. Redox reactions are literally where you shuffle electrons around, valence electrons within molecules. And this can destabilize bonds or create bonds. So if I have two molecules and I stick them in the enzyme, the enzyme will actually shuffle these electrons around so that they become stabilized and form a bond between the two. Conversely, if I have a larger molecule, the enzyme will shuffle the electrons around so that it becomes a destabilized bond, and this causes them to split apart. Okay? So all that fundamentally is happening in these enzymatic reactions is destabilizing or stabilizing electrons within the valence uh, electron sheet. And again, enzymes are classified based on what they do. And so within cells, there can be, you know, there's literally thousands upon thousands of enzymes, and they all have very specific functions. So for an example, aminotransferase would transfer amino acids. A phosphatase would transfer phosphates, okay? So the names tell you a lot about what they're actually doing at the substrate level. Again, we like to talk about these in this class because the enzymes are what uh, ultimately, or oftentimes, make you feel sick during a disease. If a bacteria releases these exoenzymes, they will start to degrade your tissue, and this is what makes you feel ill. Okay. So a lot of times, exoenzymes can be called what we call a virulence factor. A virulence factor is anything that a pathogen produces that makes itself more pathogenic, okay, or more deadly, and more sickly. 
So virulence factor can be exoenzymes, but it can be really anything that the bacteria does. It could be producing a toxin, having a thicker capsule, thicker cell wall, anything it personally does okay, to make itself a better package. The virulence factor concept is going to come up again and again and again throughout the semester. So make sure you have a good handle on what it is. It's just literally anything the bacteria or the pathogen does to make itself a better pathogen. Please don't confuse this, though, with something your body is doing. Okay? This has nothing to do with your body. It's everything from the bacteria's perspective, okay, or the pathogen's perspective. Now, enzymes are made out of protein. And as I showed you before, this protein is folded multiple times, forming a complex structure. And this complex structure determines how the enzyme is going to be functioning. So if I disrupt this complex structure, in theory, I should be able to stop the enzyme from working. Okay? This is a concept known as denaturization. So denaturization is where you take any protein, whether it's an enzyme or whatever, or other protein, and you literally just pull it apart. Okay? How do you do this? Well, you can use temperature, pH, osmotic pressure, Chemicals can do this, okay? And in fact, when we talk about how do we destroy microorganisms, a lot of these uh, destruction techniques are actually going to be denaturing proteins. An example of denaturization is when you fry an egg, okay? The clear part of a, a fresh egg is albumin, about 99% albumin. This is a protein. It's runny when it's at room temperature, but if I take it and crack it into a frying pan and heat it at a high temperature, this denatures the albumin, falls apart, becomes long strings, and these strings kind of interweave with each other. And this is what allows the egg to become solid. Okay? It's the denaturization of these proteins. All right, so those are enzymes in a nutshell. Okay? Now let's actually talk about what enzymes do for the cell. So it's great that they can lower the activation energy required to get a reaction going, but how does this actually play out within the cell, okay? And how does it ultimately end up giving the cell the things it needs? Well, when we look at individual enzymes, enzymes are very good, okay? But they only do very small changes, okay? They take two molecules, put them together, or take a molecule and split it apart. But it's usually only at one bond, or one area within that molecule. So if the cell wants really big changes to occur, it instead needs to follow something called a pathway. And this is where you have multiple enzymes that are literally lined up in a line, and they kind of tag team and go after the molecule. Okay. So each enzyme does a small change, but when you have a bunch of these together, you get really big changes. Now these pathways can come in all different shapes and sizes. They can be linear, which is the simplest. So you've got substrate up here, enzyme one attacks it, breaks it apart, and then the second enzyme goes after those new substrates that were produced. And this happens over and over and over and over again until the end result occurs. You can have cyclical. So cyclical is where you feed something into a loop, and then it can literally spin around multiple times until it's completely broken apart in this case. So it's very efficient. You can have divergent or convergent, where you start off with one, but then it splits into two, and you get in two separate products at the end of the day. Or you can have a convergent, where you have two separate products feeding in, but at the end of the day, it finishes off with just one. Okay. So really, these pathways are what allow enzymes to essentially make a cell. By doing multiple small changes sequentially, over and over and over again, eventually you get really, really big changes to occur. Now, enzymes are pretty important, right? However, enzymes can be also problematic, okay? Particularly when they are bored. So enzymes are relatively specific, at least most of them. But sometimes when they get bored, they will start doing things they shouldn't. They will modify a substrate that they're not supposed to, okay? So when that happens, the cell needs to come up with ways to control these enzymes. If you want a quick fix, the easiest way to control an enzyme is by doing something called inhibition. This is where the enzyme is still there, but you stop it from functioning. You can have competitive inhibition and non-competitive inhibition. 
Competitive inhibition is where the cell produces a molecule, usually a protein, that binds to the active site of the enzyme, blocking it, and then stopping it from working. Non-competitive inhibition is where the cell produces something or something comes into the cell that binds somewhere else on the enzyme. This changes its shape and stops it from functioning. So what does this look like in a cartoon diagram? So here we have an enzyme. You can see its normal substrate fits perfectly into the active site, which means it's going to modify that substrate. And that's what would happen down here. Now let's say the cell says, okay, enough of this, I don't want this happening anymore, you're, you're a problem. What it would do is it would then produce a molecule that looks like this, and this also has a very similar uh, shape to the active site. And because this guy is much more abundant and binds with better affinity, it will then bind to the active site, blocking it so that it doesn't modify its regular substrate anymore. Non-competitive inhibition, so here, You've got an enzyme, substrate, binds, you'll get your final product, which is great. However, if you want this to stop happening or you want to control it, um, what you could do as a cell is you could have a, a small um, molecule that actually binds somewhere else on the enzyme. This is known as the allosteric site or the regulatory site. And this will then change the shape of the enzyme so that it can no longer bind to its substrate and no longer modify. So one directly blocks the active site, the other one indirectly blocks the active site. So that's great for a short-term fix, or if you want to just slow the enzyme down a little bit. What if you want a long-time fix? The best way to do this is to either stop the enzyme from being produced altogether, or if you want the enzyme to come up, then start having it being produced. And the way that the cell does this is it goes straight to the DNA. Okay? So every cell has DNA, and the DNA essentially codes for protein, including enzymes. So if the cell doesn't want an enzyme to be produced, it just stops the DNA from being transcribed into RNA, and this stops the energy from being translated into protein, and then the enzyme doesn't get produced. Conversely, if it wants the enzyme to be produced, then it goes to the DNA, it converts that DNA or transcribes it into RNA, this RNA then gets translated into protein, folds into the enzyme, and then it starts to function. Okay. So this is for a long-term fix. Okay. If it wants to really get rid of the enzyme, because it makes it a problem there. We'll talk more specifically about how this occurs in chapter 9. Okay, so those are enzymes. Okay, and as we said, they're important. They act as catalysts. They allow for biological chemical reactions to occur. And then if we want big changes to occur, we need a lot of them, right, that work in series, and this creates what we call a pathway. Now let's focus on enzymes and their usefulness in uh, releasing energy, okay, or catabolic reactions. Now within the cell, there are really two types of reactions that can occur, exergonic and endergonic. Exergonic reactions are where you break apart molecules and release energy, okay, also known as catabolic reactions. Endergonic reactions are reactions where ultimately you're putting things together and you need to add energy into the reaction. These are also known as anabolic reactions. For the rest of this talk, we're going to focus primarily on the exergonic reactions. These are the catabolic reactions that allow you to take a molecule like glucose, for example, tear it apart, and release a ton of energy from it. And again, all of this is brought on by what we call redox reactions, or shuffling around electrons in the valence shell. Okay. Um, redox stands for reduction and oxidation. Taking one electron from one molecule and giving it to another, vice versa. Here's an example of, uh, of redox reactions. So when you're taking uh, sodium and, and chlorine, and you want to create a new molecule, all you're literally doing is taking an electron from the sodium and giving it to the chlorine. This stabilizes the bond between the two, and now you get table salt. Okay? Same thing is occurring within enzymatic reactions. Now, when this occurs, so if I have a molecule and I split it apart, okay, and I'm destabilizing electrons, if I do nothing, 
at that process, that electron as a hydrogen ion will be released and this will result in heat. Okay? And sometimes that's a good thing. For us, that's a good thing because that's what allows us to regulate our body temperature. But for most organisms, even us, we don't want our electrons being lost as heat often. So if we do that, then we're not going to be not able to store these electrons or store this energy for later use. So what the cell has done is it's created a molecule known as an electron carrier. These are proteins. NAD is the most common one, but there's also um, FAD. And what these guys do is they literally hold on to that electron temporarily so it can be used later, instead of letting it be released from the cell as heat. So if I take a molecule, put it into my enzyme, this allows for the destabilization of electron. I can actually take that electron as a hydrogen ion and store it in an electron carrier. Okay? And then I can use that electron carrier later on to produce a shit ton of ATP from it. Okay? So this is really important because this is what allows the cell to utilize these electrons as energy, at least later on. So how does this energy eventually get stored? Well, it gets stored in a molecule known as adenosine triphosphate, also known as ATP. It's got an adenine nitrogen space, a ribose, five carbon sugar, and then three phosphates, okay, or P's with O's on them. Each one of these phosphates that are added on create a bond, and this bond can be broken and energy can be released. Okay, so you can store the energy within that bond. This is an example of what adenosine triphosphate looks like, or ATP. And so you can see these three phosphates here, and the ones with the little purpley squiggly lines, those are the ones that can be broken and utilized as an energy source. So if the cell has ATP and it needs energy, it just goes, breaks that off, boom, takes the energy and uses it. Form of electron. Conversely, if it wants to store energy, all it's got to do is take a phosphate and snap it on there. Now the energy is stored in that bond. Okay? So ATP is when you have three phosphates, ADP is when you have two, and AMP is when you have only one. Okay? So if you start off with ATP and you break off one to get energy, now you have ADP. And if you're real stressed, you've got no energy or no food sources around or anything, then you can even take that ADP, break off another phosphate, release its energy, and now you're left with AMP. AMP is rarely done. You rarely go that far as a cell just because it takes a lot more to make ATP then at the end. So it's usually best just to go to ADP unless you're on your last leg and there's nothing else to do. So, the beauty of the system is that you can take a molecule like ADP, add a phosphate, get a molecule of ATP, and now you have energy stored. It is safely found within a molecule, which you then can collect in the cell, and then later on, you know, a couple minutes later, hours later, years later, you can literally take that ATP and feed it into another reaction and use that energy in the phosphate to allow that reaction to occur. Now, occasionally cells get lucky. And what I mean by that is, is occasionally when a reaction occurs within the cell, you get ATP that, for our purposes, magically forms, okay, or spontaneously forms. So an example of where this occurs is in glycolysis. So glycolysis, you break glucose up a little bit, and at that site of the reaction, ATP is made. Not much, but it's still made. So in this case, you don't need an electron carrier. The ATP is just produced at the site. This is known as substrate level phosphorylation. This is relatively rare, okay? Most ATP, at least in uh, aerobic and anaerobic organisms, is not produced at this level, okay? Only some of them. Most ATP is produced at membrane. So if you are a prokaryote, it's going to be at the cell membrane. If you are a eukaryote, it's going to be at the mitochondria where there's lots of membrane. 
This is where the electron carriers come into play. These electron carriers transfer those electrons to the membrane so that a shit ton of ATP can be made. So when you get lucky and ATP is spontaneously formed at the site of a reaction, substrate level phosphorylation. All other ATP are coming from subsequent steps, okay, or what we call the electron transport chain. All right, so let's actually talk about how all of this comes together to form catabolic reactions, okay, or what we call the catabolic pathways. This is where we are taking molecules like glucose, we're breaking it apart, all right, and in the process producing ATP, which stores the energy uh, for later use. It's like cigarettes, isn't it? Or am I back? Am I back? I'm sure. I smoked it. Okay. You can tell the smokers in here. People who can't smell it. There's smokers. All right. So, aerobic respiration. Uh, when we talk about catabolic pathways, we usually break them up into three categories. And this is based on their oxygen usage. Okay? Um, the reason why we break them up based on their oxygen usage is because the very last step where we make all of our ATP requires or, or doesn't require, depending on the cell, oxygen, all right? If you are an aerobic organism, aerobic respirer, that means you utilize elemental oxygen in that last step, okay, or O2, the stuff that we breathe in. Conversely, if you are an anaerobic respirer or an anaerobic organism, you do not use oxygen in the atmosphere, but instead you use oxygen stuck into some other molecule. So carbon trioxide, nitrous oxide, something else. But it still has oxygen there. And then the guys all by themselves are the fermenters. These are the guys that utilize zero oxygen. Okay. Out of all of these, aerobic respirers are going to be by far the most efficient. Each glucose molecule on average will give you 38 ATP. Anaerobic is next. These guys get anywhere from 2 to 36, so it can be close, but it's never as efficient as aerobic. And then the fermenters, these are the losers, they only get 2 ATP per glucose molecule. Okay? But they don't use oxygen. So if they're about to die because there's no oxygen around, this is better than dying. You may ask, why be anaerobic if it's so inefficient? Well, the answer to that is, is that oxygen is a very toxic molecule. Okay? It's very reactive. So a lot of times cells say, you know what, I don't want to deal with this because it's just going to cause me problems. I'm just going to do this with a molecule of oxygen stuck to something else, which is much safer. So these are the pathways in cartoon form. We've got aerobic, anaerobic, and fermentation. So over here we have aerobic. Glycolysis, Krebs cycle, electron transfer chain, which we'll talk about in a second. And as I said, oxygen is the final electron acceptor here, elemental oxygen, or O2. This results in by far the most ATP, around 38 per glucose molecule. Over here we have anaerobic respiration. It looks virtually identical. The only difference is the final electron acceptor. Instead of using elemental oxygen, you're using oxygen stuck to something else. Nitrous oxide, carbon trioxide, and so forth. Again, not as efficient. 2 to 36 ATP per glucose molecule. And then over here, we've got fermentation all by themselves. Each glucose molecule only gives you 2 ATP. So extremely inefficient. But no oxygen at all is required. Doesn't, not oxygen in the air, not oxygen in some other molecule. Zip up. So this is better than dying, okay? but it's still very, very inefficient. So what we're going to primarily focus on today are aerobic respirers. Okay? The reason why we're primarily going to focus on these guys is that uh, this is because these are the A, the ones that are most well studied, and B, they're the ones that often cause disease. Okay? These are the guys that use oxygen as their final electron acceptor, which means they're going to get that full 38 ATP from each individual glucose molecule. Now, when we're talking about this, we're going to only talk about it with glucose. But please keep in mind that you can feel a lot of crap into these cycles. It doesn't just necessarily need to be glucose. It can be other sugars, carbohydrates, lipids sometimes. Usually they're not as efficient, but you can feed other stuff into this. Okay? We talk about glucose again because it's the most well understood. It's the one where everyone knows everything about it. 
So, the first thing that occurs is something called glycolysis. And glycolysis is where you take is your initial step, which is this little orange box in our previous diagram. And this is where you initially take your glucose and you start to break it apart. Okay. These are all the steps in glycolysis, and I expect you to know all of these for the exam. I'm kidding. I don't even know what all of these are. Okay. This is something that you wouldn't need to know anything about unless this is what you really study. Okay. I'm doing a PhD in molecular virology, and I know about three of these. Okay. Just because it's not necessary for what I do. And neither is it going to be necessary for what you guys do. Instead, what I expect you guys to know is the end result. What do you put in and what do you get out of it? So, we've got glycolysis. Got glycolysis. So, obviously, we need to put in glucose. Makes sense. Also, we need to put in a little bit of energy, and this comes in the form of two ATP. And you may say, what the hell, that we're making energy here, we're storing energy, but it takes a little energy to get energy out. Okay, so you gotta put a little in to get something. Now, after everything is said and done, what do you get? Well, you're gonna get two pyruvates, two NADHs, and for ATP. What the hell is all that stuff? Well, the 4 ATP, these are the ATP that came from substrate level phosphorylation. Remember I told you this is where you just spontaneously get ATP during a reaction. So we put something in, we get something out, and ATP comes as a byproduct. Okay? You can see it's only 4 ATP though which is in our 38, so it's not the majority, but it is still something, okay? NADHs, this is our electron carrier. So I told you before, NAD is an electron carrier. When you have NADH, that just tells you it's got its electron with it in the form of a hydrogen ion. These will come into play later on. And then pyruvate, uh, pyruvates or pyruvic acids, these are Byproducts of glycolysis, which can be utilized by the cell either to make more ATP in the Krebs cycle, or they can be utilized by the cell to make stuff like amino acids or nucleic acids. Okay. So after everything is said and done, I put in glucose. How many ATP did I get from glycolysis? Two, right? Put two in. I get four. So 4 minus 2 is 2. So right now I'm at 2 ATP. Sounds like fermentation, right? And that's because this is all fermentation is. Everything else after this requires oxygen or oxygen molecules. Okay. So, as you can see, this is everything uh, according to your book. No. So glycolysis and fermentation are the exact same thing? Same thing. The only thing that's different with glycolysis is what happens with these pyruvates. So in a aerobic or anaerobic organism, these would be utilized for other stuff. In a fermenter, this is going to be eliminated as a waste product because there's just so much of it produced. So pyruvic acid or pyruvate. This is a molecule, as you can see here. This is a byproduct of glycolysis. And as I said, it can be utilized later in the Krebs cycle to make a lot of ATP. Or it can be utilized by the cell to make a whole bunch of crap. Okay, and we'll talk more about what that crap is later on. Now let's go and finish what we started. Okay? Now we've got these pyruvates. And as I said, we can feed them into the Krebs cycle and get more ATP from it. So let's actually talk about the Krebs cycle. Also known as the citric acid cycle if you're like 100 years old. So, Krebs cycle is next. And as I said, what we're going to be feeding into it are pyruvates. Okay? We've got a pyruvate. Also, because we're dealing with an aerobic organism, we're going to use oxygen. If we were dealing with an anaerobic organism, this would be, you know, some other form of oxygen. Not elemental, but something that has oxygen in it. But we're dealing with aerobic organisms, so we're just going to stick with 
our elemental oxygen, or O2. Now, at the end of the day, after the Krebs cycle occurs, and if you're curious about what the Krebs cycle looks like, it's this, okay? Again, a nightmare of equations and things. Don't expect you to know that for the exam, but I do expect you to know what the end result is. What we end up getting are four NADHs, one FADH, and FADH is just in another electron carrier, okay? And one ATP. Where did this ATP come from? What is the process called? It's the same process where we got these ATP that we just talked about. Substrate level phosphorylation. Okay, again, ATP is produced at the site of the reaction. It's not the majority, but it's something, right? So that's what happens when we feed a piper baby in the Krebs cycle. Cool. Are we done? No. Why? Can you hear any voice? <laughs> How many of these suckers did I make in glycolysis? Two. Two. How many of these suckers have I used so far? One. So I can do it again, right? So I got another one. This is why Krebs cycle is a cycle. Because you can just keep feeding crap into it over and over and over again, like a garbage disposal. And I did the same crap at the end of the day. So, how much ATP do I have so far? Two from glycolysis and how many from Krebs cycle? Two. So that gives me a total of four. What the hell? I thought I said 38. Where does the other 34 come from? Well, it comes from something called the electron transport chain. Okay. The electron transport chain is where the vast majority of ATP is produced within the cell. And as I mentioned before, this has to occur at membranes. Okay. So for prokaryotes, it's going to be at the cell membrane. For eukaryotes, it's going to be at the mitochondria. Why does this have to happen at a membrane? Well, it allows for something called a charged potential. So here we have an example of a bacteria. Anyone want to guess is this gram positive or gram negative? Guess again. <laughs> Gram positive. Why? It's got two layers, right? Thick cell wall, then membrane. Just two of them. Gram negative would add an additional layer up here. Okay? So we've got a gram positive organism. Now I've got all these electron carriers, and these electrons are in the form of a hydrogen, okay, or hydrogen ion. These electron carriers then go to the membrane. And things called cytochromes, which are proteins, literally take the hydrogen ion, pull it off of the electron carrier, and push it up into what we call the periplasmic space. This is the space between the membrane <coughs> and the cell wall. Cool. Why? Why is this happening? Well, what happens is, is when this ha occurs over and over and over again, you have all of these hydrogen ions stuck in the space, and this creates a charge. And this charge is reactive. So what the cell can do is it can utilize this charge to turn a special protein called ATP synthase. And when this turns, it adds a phosphate onto ADP, creating ATP. How does it turn ATP synthase? Well, the way it does it is it has a little oxygen molecule down here, acting like a magnet, and it literally takes the hydrogens, pulls them through, and then these hydrogens bind to the oxygen. What happens when you have two hydrogens and an oxygen? You get water. So not only do you get ATP from this, you get water. You also get byproducts like carbon dioxide, okay? But we're not gonna talk about that. Instead, hydrogen ions up into a space, these get pulled through ATP synthase, spinning it, adding a phosphate onto ADP, creating ATP. 
Okay. So let's talk about what actually happens at the end of the day with the electron transport chain. So for the electron transport chain to happen, we need to use our, our um, electron carriers. And those electron carriers are going to be NADH and FADH. How many NADHs do I have from one glucose molecule total? Alright, 4 plus 4 plus 2. 10. So we've got 10 NADHs. How many FADHs do I have from one glucose molecule? Ten. 2. 1 plus 1. <laughs> and how many ATP did I get from substrate level phosphorylation? Six. Oh, uh, four. Four, right? I needed two to begin with, so I've only netted four. Now, for each NADH molecule, I get three spins of ATP synthase. That means I get three ATP. So, multiply this sucker by three. That means I get 30 ATP for all of my NADHs. For FADHs, I get two spins, multiply the sucker by two, that gives me four ATP. And I've got the four from substrate level phosphorylation. So when you add all that up, I get 38 ATP. However, we often write this as 36 to 38. <coughs> Why? Because shit happens. How do you know how many spins it is? It's just based on uh, experimentation. Oh. Right. So the way that these experiments were done originally is with radioactive hydrogen. You can actually follow it and see what it's doing. So, 36 to 38, again, because uh, shit happens. Okay. And so occasionally things are going to go wrong, and when things go wrong, you may not get the full 38. So you're going to get somewhere in between. But it's still very, very energy efficient, okay, compared to all the other options. And as I said, the terminal step with aerobic organisms is using elemental oxygen, in this case O2, to grab these hydrogen ions, pulling them through ATP synthase, and eventually you get the water as a waste product. In eukaryotes, very similar process. However, instead of it occurring at the cell membrane, it is going to occur at the mitochondria. Okay? When we look at the mitochondria under a microscope, it's got highly invaginated membranes, which means membranes that are just kind of curvy. And what this does is it increases the surface area of the membrane, meaning you can have more of these ATP synthases. And so in the long run, these are really, really, really good at making ATP. Okay? They're very efficient at doing And at the end of the day, this is your book, Stupid Math. I think my way is better. Uh, you end up with 36 to 38 ATP. Okay. This is just looking at it in a cartoon diagram. It just shows you glycolysis is a pathway that is linear, and Krebs cycle is a cyclical or circular path. Anaerobic organisms. So anaerobic organisms go through virtually the same steps. Everything's identical. The only thing that changes is oxygen. It's no longer elemental oxygen. It is now oxygen in some sort of molecule. Okay. So it would change here, and it would change at the very last step with electron transport. What this ends up meaning is that you get less ATP. It's less efficient. Okay. Fermentation. So fermentation, as we've already talked about, is essentially this. Glycolysis, because that's the only step that requires zero oxygen at all. Okay. Now, as I said, when you are doing glycolysis, it's very inefficient, so you go through a lot of glucose, which means you're going to build up a lot of this stuff, pyruvates. And so these pyruvates need to be released as a waste product. 
And these waste products ultimately become either alcohols or acids. Because they get processed by the cell a little bit. If it's alcohols, then it's going to be in the form of ethyl alcohol, also known as ethanol or vodka. And acetic are going to be acids. So it could be acetic acid, which is bitter. It could be lactic acid, which is used for curling milk, making cheeses. Or it could be succinic acid, which if you concentrate it, can burn the skin. These are useful in industry, not so much for pathogens. We don't really care too much about it in that context. But it's useful in ind industry because, like I said, you can use it to make alcohol, organic acids, dairy products like yogurts and cheeses are produced using lactic acid. And then some vitamins, antibiotics, and even hormones can be produced in this process. So it's important for industry, um, but again, not so important as far as uh, pathogens are concerned. How does this happen? Well, up here we have glucose and then glycolysis. As I said, we get a lot of py uh, pyruvic acid or pyruvates. These then get processed further into things like ethyl alcohol or ethanol and or lactic acid if it's acetic fermentation. Now, it's important to note that all organisms can go through fermentation, okay, even us. However, higher order organisms like ourselves cannot survive alone on fermentation. So it's a good thing to do for short periods of time when you don't have much oxygen but it's not something you can survive off of because these waste products become deadly or toxic. Single-celled organisms like yeasts and prokaryotes, however, can survive for very long periods of time on fermentation. And that's because they just spit the waste products out and then move away. Okay? But if it does build up in a container, for example, it can cause problems. An example of where this occurs in humans, um, we ferment, we are acidic fermenters, and we produce lactic acid. So an example of where this occurs is when your muscles get sore. When your muscles get sore, you're using your muscles more, um, and they're not getting enough oxygen from the blood, and so they start to go into a fermentation pathway so that they don't die. In the process, they release lactic acid. This gets released into the muscle tissue, and this causes inflammation, and this is what makes you get sore. Okay. So it can happen in all organisms, but it is not sustainable in all organisms. Alcohol fermentation, again, ethanol is the primary product, or byproduct, as well as carbon dioxide. And this is exactly how beer gets produced, right? The alcohol and the carbon dioxide both come from the yeast in the beer. Acetic fermentation, this is primarily seen in bacteria as well as higher order organisms. And as I mentioned, you can make any kind of flavor of acid, really. Acetic, lactic, susonic, formic, blah, 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 blah. Okay, and a whole bunch of different acids can be produced in this manner. And some organisms can make different acids depending on what type of nutrients they get or how concentrated they are. So it really just depends on a bunch of factors. Okay, so that is catabolism and all of the processes required to break down glucose into small bits and pieces to eventually uh, make ATP. And this is great if you want to make ATP. However, sometimes that's not the end result. Sometimes the cell needs to make other stuff, okay? And a lot of times what it will do is instead of going all the way to completion to get all those ATP, it will stop somewhere in the process and utilize some of the byproducts of that reaction to make other things. This is a concept known as amphibolism. This is where instead of going all the way down to the very bottom and just tearing that glucose apart, you stop in the middle and you say, hey, actually this molecule of uh, partially degraded glucose looks kind of cool. I'm going to use it for something else. Okay. This is what it would look like in a cartoon diagram. So here we have glucose. We could take glucose and we could tear it to shit, getting a bunch of ATP and a bunch of basic uh, inorganic molecules. Or we can go, okay, you know what, I need amino acids. So instead of just getting all the ATP I can get and all this stuff that's really hard to make into amino acids at the end of the day, I can just stop at pyruvic acid and then feed that up into the anabolic pathways and then use that as a backbone to make amino acid. The reason for doing this is it takes a hell of a lot of energy to go from pyruvic acid to an amino acid 
than it does to take all these basic bits and pieces and eventually try to make amino acid out of it. Okay. Just to you know, really send the message home, here we have pyruvic acid up here. Here we have beta alanine. They are virtually identical. The only thing that is different is this ammonium group. So all the cell has to do is slap on one ammonium group, and now it's got beta alanine, which it needs to make protein. If it didn't do this route and it tried to make beta alanine from just carbons and hydrogens and nitrogens, it would be almost impossible. It would cost so much energy the cell would die. So again, it kind of just it goes back and forth depending on what its requirements are. It doesn't always just have to go one group of entry away. You can kind of mix it up a bit if it needs to. And so now we have all of this ATP where energy is stored. And the cell can utilize this ATP to allow for anabolic reactions. And this is really what the ultimate goal of the cell is. These anabolic reactions are taking molecules, sticking them together, and this makes bigger, larger molecules. And when this happens over and over and over again, you get a bigger and larger cell. Okay? These anabolic reactions can be used to make things like amino acids, proteins, nucleic acids, so DNA, RNA, pretty much everything in the cell is produced using these anabolic reactions. And when all of these come together, eventually you will form a cell, and you have all of these bits and pieces making tons and tons of things. And then eventually, when too much of these things are produced, the cell goes, okay, I've got too much of these, now it's time to actually become two instead of staying as one. Cell splits into two, and now you have two daughter cells. So not only do these allow for the cell to be produced as uh, in general, but it also allows the cell to reproduce and go through binary fission. Again, we're not going to talk about any particular anabolic reactions in this class, and that's because they're very, very complex. There are literally millions of different anabolic reactions that occur within the cell. And there's no way you can understand them all or really get the good gist of them, at least not in this class. So instead, what we're going to do is when we get to chapter 9, we will talk about the end result of these anabolic reactions. What gets produced. So we'll talk about the DNA, the RNA, the protein, and how that actually becomes a cell. Now lastly, uh, your book talks a lot about photosynthesis. I cut it down a little bit just because photosynthetic organisms are not pathogens, so it's not that important for us. But I still left in at least one slide for it. And the reason why I leave this slide in is because some people may ask, well, where the hell does this glucose come from? Well, the answer to that is, is all of the glucose comes from photosynthetic organisms. Photosynthetic organisms can take inorganic molecules like water and carbon dioxide with a little bit of sunlight and convert it into organic molecules <coughs> such as glucose. This glucose then gets stored within the uh, photosynthetic cell, which are mostly plants. And then some animal comes over, eats the plant, and gets the glucose into their system. We then kill the animal, eat the glucose from the animal cells. However, that glucose did not come originally from those animals. Instead, it came from the plants. So all of the glucose we have, all the glucose any animal has, originally came from photosynthetic plants. And that is it for chapter 8. Any questions? A lot of math today, huh?